with our messages <coughs> and get caught up to uh, some of the more recent sermons that we've done. What we are doing is month by month we are documenting the fulfillment of prophecy in current events. We are trying to show, it's part of our mission at Keep the Faith, to show how what God said in prophecy, both in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, is actually coming to pass in our generation, not in some future generation, in the generation of our children or our grandchildren. It's coming to pass in our generation. And if you would like to keep up to date on current events, be sure and fill out the little pink card and return it to me today. I'll be happy to see that you get on the list. We are a faith ministry. Keep the Faith is a faith ministry. We're supported by the gifts of God's people. We don't charge for any of our subscriptions. And uh, we feel that's the best way because some people can't afford a subscription. Other people can and they can support you know, others. So we feel that the best way to have uh, the influence of these CDs spread all around is to send them free of charge and people can share them and by the way we want you to share them with your friends also but if you'll fill out those pink cards we'll be happy to get them back uh, and uh, be sure and send you the monthly CDs after each sermon on CD we have a little musical item followed by about 20 minutes of prophetic intelligence briefings That's what we call prophetic intelligence briefings and those briefings are when we take little news items that you might have missed and cast them in their prophetic context. Um, people enjoy those because they are very uh, enlightening about things going on in the world that uh, you might have uh, overlooked or didn't hear about for some reason, you know. And there are many things that... Um, that are um, happening that uh, in fact there's so many things going on it's hard to keep up we don't even have enough time in that 20 minutes to cover all the things going on in, in the world and so we opened a website and you can go to our website every couple of days we put up new intel prophetic intelligence briefings there on our website as well because there's more than we, what we can put on on CD and uh, we try to keep uh, current on things that are happening. And you go there every couple of days, you'll find new prophetic intelligence briefings posted there. And you can scroll through them and read all the ones you've missed and whatever else. Also, I, as you probably know, am teaching uh, uh, classes at Heartland College in Virginia. And um, I brought with me some clipboards so that you can subscribe to the Heartland Ministry Report. The Heartland Ministry Report, there's some examples of it, some samples on the table in the back. Please take them with you. The Ministry Report is just chock full of stories of how lives are being changed by the young people there at Heartland, by the Holy Spirit through them, and by the staff there. And you'll find uh, many encouraging stories and opportunities there. Uh, to read about. A good Sabbath afternoon reading. And um, the Heartland Ministry Report. Also, we have the Sabbath School Lesson Comments and the Last Generation Magazine. You can request information on all those things. And uh, that way, we'll be happy to send those things to you so that you can uh, become familiar. By the way, I also brought with me a catalog of many of the sermons that we have done uh, in, uh, through Keep the Faith. Um, I'd like to suggest that you'll notice that in the first page on the top there is a, a list of sermons that, that I have done since I took over Keep the Faith up until about a year ago. Uh, the ones that are uh, more recent, uh, you'll have to, you can get the titles from our website, but if you want to order them, fee please feel free to do so. Perhaps the most practical Christian, with practical Christian principles, is the five-part series on Joseph's troublesome coat. Those of you who received that probably remember that series. And also, um, you know, there's other things there that I think you might, you might find very interesting. Please feel free and take a copy of the, 
<clears throat> the catalog. Now this morning, I want to talk to you about the horrific, the absolutely horrific fires that took place in Australia. These fires roared through one of the most beautiful regions of Australia with breakneck speed and devastating ferocity. And they've spoken to me in a powerful way. And I'd like to share with you some thoughts concerning them. You know, it seems like it's a long, long way from here. And it is. But brothers and sisters, what happened in Australia is perhaps a harbinger of things to come. Most people didn't think of the prophetic implications of the havoc and devastation that was heaped upon that beautiful region as more than 500,000 acres were destroyed by the fires. More than 1,800 homes were destroyed and over 7,000 people were left homeless. But the greatest tragedy is that more than 200 people, 210 last count that I saw, were killed in the fires, literally burned alive. Think about that. Literally burned alive, even while many of them were trying to escape the flames in their cars. This is a powerful warning, brothers and sisters. People stood by helplessly as their farms, their cattle, their sheep, their horses were destroyed in the fury of the inferno, which was greatly strengthened by the oil in the eucalyptus trees and the dry wind that fanned the flames into, into a terrific firestorm. Let's begin with Scripture. We read our verse this morning already, but I'd like to emphasize something here. Deuteronomy chapter 32, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 22, tells us that there was a fire that God has kindled in mine anger, he says, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them, I will spend mine arrows upon them, they shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. What a statement. God is warning His people, brothers and sisters. God is trying to help us to understand what's coming upon the world. And I wonder if many of the people of this world are froward and arrogant. Notice what it says here. Um, verse 21 says, They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Verse 20 tells us why. He said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. Brothers and sisters, when God's people lose their faith, they become proud and arrogant. And they live in a way that is froward, which means that they're living in, in this arrogant lifestyle. As if there's no God. They worship the things of their, of their lives. They don't worship God in the true sense. They might come to church on Sabbath. But they don't understand true worship. He says, they've provoked me with jealousy with that which is not God. How many of God's people today live in such a way as if there is no God? They defy, as it were. They ignore the claims of God on their lives and live just as if they were in the beautiful valley of Sodom. 
They arrogantly defy God and His judgments. They mean nothing to them. Even many of God's own people rebel and have no fear of His wrath. The leaders of God's people continue to lead them in ways that God has forbidden. They preach smooth things to them. They do not warn them of their danger. The warnings of God to the rebellious heart must be taken seriously. Dear friends, we need to see that the signs of the times are warning us of the wrath of God to come. Similar to the firestorm that consumed Sodom, the fires in Australia were quite unexpected by most of the people who lived in the towns and villages that were destroyed. And they're a warning to all of us that one day God in the judgments of God will fall on all those who have turned from God and His truth. He said, they have moved me to blasphemy. Uh, they moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. Sorry. And the people today are living as if there is no God. No day of reckoning. Today, tomorrow will just be like today. Today is just like it was yesterday. Where is God, they say. In the days of Noah, the Bible says they pursued evil continually. The, the thoughts of their hearts and the imagination of their hearts was only evil continually. So these verses graphically depict how God views those that turn from His mercies and go after strange gods. God will not be silent forever. He will one day rise up and consume the wicked. But we don't like to hear about the day of judgment, do we? <laughs> we don't like to talk about the time that God will punish. We only want to hear smooth things. And pastors often obligingly do what is expected of them. But my friends, I have to share with you the warnings found in the Word of God. Natural disasters in this world are in fact a warning to us of the time to come when God shall rise up and punish the earth. Here's an interesting statement from the pen of God's messenger. It's found in Last Day Events, page 111. Last Day Events, page 111. She says, The Lord gives warnings to the inhabitants of the earth, as in the Chicago fire, and in the fires in Melbourne, London, and the city of New York. Where, where is she talking about when she refers to Melbourne? She's talking about Melbourne, Australia, in Victoria, the very place where these fires took place. Manuscript release. Well, I think I mentioned that's from Last Day Events, page 111. Apparently, this was not the first time there have been fires in Melbourne. And while we don't know much about what happened in 1897 when this was written, there have been fires there before, a little over 100 years ago. In fact, there have been fires there every year for the last few years. But they're not... They were, they're out in the bush, out where there aren't any homes, out where there aren't any people. You see, this statement that Ellen White made here was written when there was a Sunday law movement underhandedly and stealthily making its way into Congress in the United States. I want you to think about that, the timing on this. Back when the fires took place in Chicago and Melbourne and London, there was a Sunday law movement that was underlying and, and under this whole thing. It was stealthily moving into Congress. God was warning the people of the world against the judgments that would come on them for their disregard of the law of God, especially as it relates to Sunday laws. But those who are promoting Sunday observance see in these disasters great reason to press their rebellion to God's law even further. They will eventually blame Sabbath keepers for the very disasters God sends to warn them and waken them to the law of God. In other words, the disasters that God allows to happen or that He actually uh, uh, brings 
are warnings against breaking the law of God, particularly the fourth commandment. You understand what I'm saying? But the people turn these around and accuse God's people who keep the Sabbath of being under the judgments of God. That's called blame shifting. Have you ever seen anybody do any blame shifting? <laughs> we know what blame shifting is, don't we? That's what they do. So here's an important statement from Review and Herald, July 16, 1901. Satan is playing the game of life for the souls of men, and he is succeeding in a way surprising even to himself. Men are straining every nerve to gain earthly treasure, but when eternal riches are offered them, they turn carelessly away. Very easily the enemy persuades them to renounce their supreme, sorry, uh, to renounce their supreme good. Satan hides Christ and heaven from their view because they choose to have it so. Why do they ha have Christ hidden from them? Because they choose it. Led by him, they worship the world and the things of the world. Too late, they will find that they must stand before God without a fit preparation. To hear the words, depart from me and to be forever banished from the divine presence. That's quite a statement. In this work, she says, Satan pretends to be very religious. He finds this the most effective way to carry out the work he began in heaven. Under his guidance, the Christian world has made void the law of God by tearing down the seventh day Sabbath and exalting in its stead a common working day. Let's not forget that what goes on behind the scenes and underhandedly in our world today has an impact upon what's going on in terms of natural disasters. As men depart further and further from God, Satan is permitted to have power over the children of disobedience. He hurls destruction upon men. There is calamity by land and sea. Property and life are destroyed by fire and flood. Satan resolves to charge this upon those who refuse to bow to the idol which he has set up. His agents point to Seventh-day Adventists as the cause of the trouble. Get ready, my friends. This is what's coming. And don't think that natural disasters won't stimulate this. Natural disasters actually potentiate the mentality of breaking God's law and accusing those who actually keep it. His agents point to the Seventh-day Adventists as the cause of trouble. These people stand out in defiance of law, they say. What law? Human law. They desecrate Sunday. Were they compelled to obey the law for Sunday observance, there would be a cessation of these terrible judgments. I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, the context that we're talking about. Ellen White was writing this at the time when fires were consuming cities and lands in these various places. Perhaps one of the most beautiful places in all of Australia is the forest and mountains to the northeast of Melbourne in the Murrindindi Shire and beyond the Yarra Ranges. Over the years Many towns and villages sprang up in and around this forest area. Marysville, Healesville, Buxton, Narbathong, King Lake, Whittlesea, Flowerdale, Churchill, and other villages and hamlets are located in some of the most rich and beautiful forest areas that you could possibly imagine. The Black Spur Highway near Marysville... Narbathong and King Lake was a gorgeous drive with tall eucalyptus trees known as mountain ash, straight as needles, ascending toward the sky, towering a hundred feet above the forest floor. Huge tree ferns 
covered the rest of the forest floor with their enormous fronds bowing gracefully from the top, adding their lush green density to the astonishing beauty of the forest. I've driven through this Black Spur Highway many times. And I've been in Australia for a number of reasons to teach at the school there, which is in that area, called Highwood College that was started by Russell Standish some years ago. And every time as I've driven through this area, I've admired the beauty and the graciousness of this particular forest. Its alluring beauty takes my mind to our heavenly home and the beauty we will behold there. Pure white cockatoos with their yellow cock feather. Parrots with their red and blue wings. And the laughing kookaburra. All made this beautiful place their home. Kangaroos, wallabies, koalas, and countless other species live in the hills and small mountains of this area. Most of these forests are to the east, as I said, and in the northeast of Melbourne. The state of Victoria had been having severe drought conditions for several years. Everything was tinder dry. February is summertime in Australia, and the summer heat can quite normally reach nearly 40 degrees Celsius, or what's that, about 95 or so um, Fahrenheit. But on Sabbath, February 7, one month ago, Temperatures had soared to record highs of 46 degrees Celsius or 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Only a week before the fires, more than 200 elderly and sick had died from the excessive heat, which was 43 degrees for three days in a row, and it, it actually caused some, some deaths, and the mortuaries were full. But on Sabbath, February 7, a dry wind had kicked up that day, which blew through the trees, offering a little relief and slightly cooler temperatures for the koala bears and the wallabies and kangaroos, as well as the human inhabitants of this area. These very conditions, however, combine together to create an ideal environment for the perfect firestorm. Most people living in that area did not understand their danger. They had lived in these forests for many years. Some of them perhaps many, many years. And perhaps they thought that their towns and villages were generally secure from any serious calamity. <laughs> After all, they had never had a serious fire in a developed area, in this developed area in living memory. Never. Perhaps some, at least, trusted that the government would prevent any fires from coming into the towns. <laughs> is, it, is it wise, brothers and sisters, to depend on the government? In any case, they were almost completely oblivious to their danger. Perhaps only subconsciously they recognized that there was a remote chance that a fire in the forest could cause some damage, but they never imagined that such a fire could absolutely devastate their beautiful homes, thriving businesses, and quaint villages and towns. Human nature resists the idea of danger. We naturally want to minimize danger or put it off in the distant future. We do not like to think that catastrophe can happen now or very soon. We put off preparation, and when disaster comes, we are caught unprepared. The Bible says that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. This is the way it is. In our own Christian life, we think that our lives will continue until we are old and die of old age. We don't give much thought to the idea that our lives could end today, instantly. And moreover, we don't seem to place a high valuation on God's judgments against the wicked. 
most of the people in Marysville and Narbathong and the nearby towns and villages were enjoying the weekend. It was business as usual with hardly a thought that this day would be any different from any other lazy Saturday. They were, they were not thinking about uh, how that shortly they would be desperately fighting for their lives and property against a furious and unrelenting inferno. They had no idea that they were about to be consumed by an overwhelming force that was so big that it took tens of thousands of firefighters several weeks to put it out. And by the way, the fires are still going on. They're not in, at the moment, in dangerous areas where they're endangering lives. But they're still going on, and firefighters are still fighting those fires. Black Saturday, as February 7 has been designated, started out really beautiful. The sky was glorious, and the day promised to be hot, but fine. Not long before... Two large bushfires, not far from the town of Churchill, had started out where no one was living. Authorities are certain that at least some of the dozens of fires that were um, active on February 7 were started by arson. But in any case, two huge bushfires combined to make one enormous fire known, interestingly, as the Kilmore East Fire. <laughs> and the blazes quickly got out of control as the wind whipped their flames from one treetop to another. They shot high in the sky in a spectacular and unstoppable inferno. Thick black smoke billowed skyward over 220,000 hectares, or nearly 500,000 acres, were destroyed very quickly in that one fire alone. Another 13,000 hectares, or 26,000 acres, were destroyed in another fire in the Darby Swamp area. You don't know where these areas are, perhaps. But if you look on the maps on Google, you can find these areas. Quickly the fire spread as acre after acre were consumed by the flames. First it took small farms. Then it moved in on the towns and villages and took houses, businesses, and other buildings. The wind swept the fire advancing at breakneck speed. Within 24 hours, over 1,700 homes, ultimately 1,800 homes, were laid waste. More than 200 people have been burned to death, more than half of them in the King Lake area with 114, and thousands had been left homeless. Such huge fires need a lot of oxygen. One report from a friend of mine said that the dust on the ground three miles away was sucked up into the air 30 feet or more as the fire demanded huge supplies of oxygen. Firefighters vainly tried to hold the fires back. Airplanes and helicopters tried to water bomb the fire, but it was useless. More than 20 survivors are in hospital with serious burns to over more than 30% of their bodies. Many have burns to their feet and hands that were inflicted as they ran or crawled out through the fire to escape. Some also have burnt airways from smoke inhalation. I'm quoting from the Melbourne Age. It's like a bomb blast, said firefighter Drew Adamson. He stood and watched his own home burn to the ground after saving someone else's. He, along with most of his colleagues, were overcome with exhaustion after battling fires for days on end. More than 10,000 fire crews from all over the world were flown into Victoria to battle the fires. I want you to put yourself for a few minutes into the shoes of a family. Let's say a family in the town of Marysville. 
a small, sleepy town with about 500 homes. You're not a Sabbath keeper, so you are doing your normal Saturday routine. You are uh, perhaps doing the laundry, or fixing something on your car, or taking a leisurely nap in the living room of your home, or watching television, you know, what people do on a Saturday. Suddenly you look up and you see the black thick smoke of, and flames above the distant trees just outside your property. And you realize that you are about to be attacked by the fire. You had not thought about this possibility, so you had made no preparations. Confusion and panic sets in as you try to think fast what to do. Furthermore, you had no information about the speed of the fire or the direction of the fire. But it is now obviously bearing down on you and your family and your neighbors and you have an agonizing choice to make. Do you stay and try to protect your property or do you flee for your lives? Imagine the horror of making the wrong decision or of making your decision to flee too late. Some people stayed to protect their earthly possessions and were consumed in the fire. Some fled just in time to escape and some delayed and were consumed in their cars as they tried to flee. One faithful Adventist family was bushwalking on one of the nearby mountains Sabbath afternoon with some of the health guests of Highwood Health Center, an Adventist self-supporting institution that's right in that very area. When they received a mobile phone call telling them of the oncoming fires, they quickly returned to their cars and fled down the mountain and passed through Marysville just before the fire destroyed the town. They didn't even have time to collect their most important belongings from their own house, which was consumed in the flames. Nevertheless, God's protection of them was nothing short of miraculous. A few minutes later, and they would have been caught in the maelstrom. What happened in the Victoria fires is described in the book Maranatha, page 37. Fires will break out unexpectedly and no human effort will be able to quench them. The only reason that the fires stopped burning in, in, in such populated areas was because the, the wind turned. Turned back on the fire. You know, I mean, uh, the palaces of earth, she says, will be swept away in the fury of the flames. Some did everything right, said Victoria Premier John Bumby, but still their homes were destroyed. Perhaps we, could not we would not classify all these homes in these little villages as palaces. But compared to the way most of the population of this world actually lives, perhaps they would certainly qualify. The following warning from God's last day messenger is very pertinent. It's Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 356 and 357. There will soon be a sudden change in God's dealings. The world in its perversity is being visited by casualties, by floods, fires, storms, earthquakes, famines, wars, and bloodshed. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, yet He will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath His way in the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds are the dust of His feet. Oh, that men might understand the patience and long-suffering of God. He is putting under restraint His own attributes. He, he hates sin so much that it is 
as if it were he is a consuming fire to anything connected with sin. But he restrains himself. His omnipotent power is under the control of omnipotence. Oh, that men would understand that God refuses to be wearied out with the world's perversity and still holds out the hope of forgiveness even to the most undeserving. Oh, brothers and sisters. But his forbearance will not always continue. Who is prepared for the sudden change that will take place in God's dealing with sinful man? Who will be prepared to escape the punishment that will certainly fall upon the transgressors? And last day events, page 26 says, In fires, in floods, in earthquakes, in the fury of the deep, in calamities by sea and by land, the warning is given that God's Spirit will not always strive with men. That's what God said in the days of Noah. Imagine the terror of trying to escape the Victoria fires, or the desperate agony of those overtaken by the flames. When you suddenly realize that you have no hope of escape, and the fire has overtaken you, and that you will be burned alive. What agony! This is the terror that the wicked will feel under the wrath of God. This is a solemn warning to all of us that God will not always strive with men. The day of God is coming when millions will experience the same overwhelming fear and terror. We hear now of earthquakes in diverse places, wrote Ellen White in Testimonies to Ministers, page 444. Of fires, of tempests and disasters by sea and land and pestilence and famine. What weight do these signs have upon you? This is only the beginning of what shall be. Do you see that? She says it's only the beginning. What we saw there in Australia and the fires here in Southern California, other places, as well as other natural disasters, these things are God's warning of what will be. The description of the day of God is given through John by the Revelator. The cry of the terror-stricken myriads has fallen upon the ear of John. The great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The apostle himself was awed and overwhelmed. The fires in Victoria are only a small token, my friends, of what it will be like in the day of the Lord. Desire of Ages, page 636 says that everything in the world is in agitation. The signs of the times are ominous. Coming events cast their shadows before. The Spirit of God is withdrawing from the earth. Coming events cast their shadows before. What does that mean? My friends, it means that the shadows that we that, that tell us what's coming down the line are happening now in little ways. See, the fire in Australia is a shadow of the great conflagration that will come when God's Spirit is fully withdrawn from the earth. And it says the Spirit of God is withdrawing from the earth, and calamity follows calamity by sea and land. There are tempests, earthquakes, fires, floods, murders of every grade. Who can read the future? Where is security? There is assurance in nothing, brothers and sisters, that is human or earthly. Don't think that your house is safe. Not from the wrath of God. Perhaps one of the most signal providences of God, you know, whenever God deals out some judgment on the human race, He mixes it with mercy. Especially mercy for His people. Don't you love that? Now, the end of time, it's going to be exactly the same. By the way, during this build-up to the very last crisis and conflict and, and judgments of God, the mercy is mixed in with the judge, justice for both the righteous and the wicked. 
But in the day of God, there will be mercy mixed with justice, but the justice will fall on the wicked and the mercy will fall on the righteous. You understand what I'm saying? That in other words, it becomes so stark, so clear, so obvious, the separation that has taken place between God's people and the world, that God can rain down His judgments and also rain down His mercy, and both are affected accordingly, and only in that way. Perhaps one of the most signal providences of God was the protection provided to Highwood College, Highwood College and Health Center. Nestled in this beautiful forest area is a small self-supporting Adventist institution run by dedicated Christian people, Adventist Christian people. As the fires blasted through Marysville and Narbathong, Highwood was in danger. Narbathong is only a mile away. In fact, the fires were all around this little institution. One man, when the smoke was billowing, he got in his, his uh, car, his van, and he checked the, the highway that is the Black Spur Highway. It's called the Marunda Highway also. The only road going through this area to see if he could get past the danger. But it was impossible. Burning bark from exploding trees fell on his van as he neared Narbathong. So he turned back to campus and prepared with about 20 others to fight the fires. Perhaps in vain. Just as the fire was within two kilometers or one mile from Highwood College and Health Center, the wind changed 200 degrees, according to personal reports, pushing the fire back on itself and saving the institution from destruction. It was as if the angels of God had wafted their wings over the campus and blew the fire in the opposite direction. During the fires, with smoke all around them, a patch of clear blue sky stayed overhead as a token of God's protection over their property. The flames had, been, had come to within 300 meters of the forest immediately to the northeast of Highwood and burned to the edge of the highway but did not cross the road. It's as if God said, thus far and no farther. Three miles away in Narbathong and Marysville, there was heavy loss of life and property. Psalm 29, verse 7 says, The voice of the Lord delivereth, sorry, divideth the flames of the fire. And while the raging and unquenchable fires warn us of God's judgment, His protection of faithful souls reminds us that if we are faithful to do His will, He will preserve. Only with thine eye shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Those people there at Highwood College have neighbors and acquaintances and friends who either don't have their homes or they lost their lives in the flames. But they were preserved. You know, one of my friends uh, wrote to me, and said that all around us, um, the fires burned on the other side of the mountain range. They're in a little valley, so they've got three sides that are kind of higher than, than they are. And the fires were all burning on the other sides of those mountains. And then down towards the city of, or the town of Narbathong. They said... <clears throat> It left a buffer of forest to protect even the beauty of the place. It's like a shining island of green in a wilderness of black 
wasteland. Imagine that. This beautiful area is now a black wasteland. But there is one little island in the middle of it all where God's institution is and was protected from the flames. The Lord has given evidence by His power that He could in one short hour dissolve the whole frame of nature. He can turn things upside down and destroy the things that man has built up in his most firm and substantial manner. In fires and floods and earthquakes, in the fury of the great deep, in calamities by sea and land, a warning is given that God's Spirit will not always strive with men. Brothers and sisters, how many of you, when you heard in the news about those people down there in Australia, thought about these statements in the spirit of prophecy and in the Bible? Did you? Did you think about what God was trying to say by this calamity in Australia? You know, a few years ago, we had the tsunami, the earthquake and tsunami there out in, in, in the Indian Ocean. It's a long way from us. 250,000 people lost their lives. Did you think about the warning that God was giving to His people by these things? You see, friends... There is much worse that's going to come on this world. And by the way, even I believe that there's going to be worse calamities that come even before we come to the last and final calamity. You understand what I'm saying? It's going to be, get ready for it. You better start expecting it. And when you see these things, think about them from a prophetic standpoint. One of the purposes of Keep the Faith is to help God's people develop a prophetic mindset. That everything that happens, you sort it by prophecy. Some things aren't important, other things are. You see what I'm saying? The prophetic mindset helps you to prioritize the things you read in the news. What do people mostly read in the news first? What's the first thing they open to? <laughs> the sports page, you know? How important is that in terms of prophecy? Well, it's firstly virtually worthless. Why do people love to look at the football games on television? You know? It's because they don't understand, brothers and sisters. They are blind. The news agencies give a lot of prominence to things that are of little prophetic value. And very little prominence to things that are of enormous prophetic value. Usually. There are exceptions, of course. But usually, that's how it is. We have to develop a mindset that is different from the world. You know, I, <laughs> I've been talking to people about some other current events going on, like the election of Barack Obama and, and the prophetic implications of his election to the presidency of the United States. And, and I'm not talking about Adventist people. I'm talking about non-Adventist people. And from time to time, I have an opportunity to talk to, to people about these things. And a lot of times, they have strong convictions, you know, one way or the other, about politics. Friends... Politics are of little importance. It's prophecy that's of, of great importance. And they're not looking at politics from the perspective of prophecy. They don't see. And so they think that electing a certain person to the presidency, you know, whether it's Obama or Bush, doesn't matter. You know, President Bush was elected by uh, a popular vote also. And his credit, uh, not credit ratings, his um, credibility ratings were almost as high as Barack Obama's are right now, back when he started his presidency eight years ago. What I'm trying to say is that people think emotionally. They don't think with their brains. And they don't understand prophecy, so they don't comprehend the deeper things going on behind the scenes. 
It is our privilege, brothers and sisters, to understand. Daniel chapter 12. Let's close with this verse. Daniel chapter 12. I think I've read that before, this verse before in this church. Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. Many shall be, what? Purified and made white and tried. My friends, you cannot survive the coming crisis unless you are purified and tried and made white. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. And I'm including God's people in that, brothers and sisters. None of the wicked shall understand. You might even have an intellectual understanding of prophecy. But most of God's people today, brothers and sisters, aren't paying attention. Therefore, they cannot understand. And then it says in the last part, but the wise shall understand. Are you wise today, brothers and sisters? If you are wise, you are purifying your life and overcoming your sins. That's how you become wise. That's how you will understand the deep things of God. If you want to understand what God is really saying, if you want to understand the truth in its fullness and its comprehensiveness, you must purify your life. And by the way, you can't purify your life. That has to be done by the Holy Spirit. But you have to invite the Holy Spirit in. And you have to turn from your sins by the grace of Jesus Christ. If Jesus lives in you, you can have victory over your sins. Because if you're crucified with Christ, then it's no longer you that's alive, but Christ lives in you. Isn't that right? And wherever Christ is, there is no sin. It's simple logic. If you've got Christ in your heart, then you will overcome. When you sin, you don't have Christ in your heart. It's as simple as that. If you want to understand the times in which we live... You must have the experience of Daniel chapter 10, of being tried and purified and made white. May the Lord bless us as we contemplate the things that happen in our world. Some of them are horrific, but they teach us lessons for our times, for the days in which we live. Shall we pray? Let's kneel and ask God's blessing. Our Father in heaven, we are saddened by the loss of life because of unexpected and vicious fires. We realize that this is a, a notice, a heavenly notice, that there is a time coming when God's judgments will fall upon the earth. We also notice that your protection is provided for those who are faithful. And we thank you for that. May we understand and order our lives according to the grace of Christ and according to the Ten Commandments. In every way, may we purify ourselves. May our experience through Jesus Christ purify us that we may walk free of the taint of sin. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen.